Well, as you know, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, in the midst of deciding whether or not to endorse the uh, eighth principle. And today, uh, Joanne will speak uh, on the pros and cons of that. Uh, more con than pro, I think. Uh, and uh, she will now speak. And then after uh, she speaks, uh, Hunter will come forward and give his, his opinion. So Joanne, you have the pulpit. You have some slides that I think Beth is pulling up now to kind of go with the talk. I want to start out by saying, and I've been limited to 10 minutes, so I'll say it quickly. This is a hard talk for me to give because some of the people in this fellowship that I admire the most, I know are very much in support of the eighth principle. Um, but I am not, after doing lots of reading and research, I'm not in support. And this is my attempt to say, to explain why. So, We'll start with this slide. At one time, we UUs were stereotyped as this, the flower children of the 60s, a bit countercultural, a bit idealist, but mostly into spreading the love. Today, the stereotype is a whole lot different. <laughs> Do I put that one up? <laughs> okay. It's the old uptight school marm determined to stop slap the hands of anyone who disagrees with church, church theology and to accuse them of heresy and damnation. I shudder every time I see a Facebook post from the UUA like this one. I'll go up. And this is just an example. Let's dispense with the pretense espoused by the book-burning bigots that racism is a deviation from our founding principles. Only when we grapple with hard truths could we grow. Immigrant bashing is a recurring sickness in America but one we can push to the margins and isolate. A cultural flashpoint arises, no matter how small or ambiguous, and the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, is ready to pounce. Someone bans a book somewhere in America and we are on it. Expect 100 Facebook posts this week about how certain Americans are engaging in a cover-up of real history, and if we don't act now, we will all become victims of a massive cover-up of slavery in America or concentration camps in Europe. A Black man is injured in police custody. Another 100 posts before the facts of the case are even released. We say it is better to assume good intentions of those we encounter in daily life. But is that really how we, you, you see the world? Or are we instead on the lookout for any hint of racism, sexism, misogyny, oppression, police brutality, colonialism, transphobia, reproductive injustice, patriarchy, or homophobia? I saw this post on Facebook recently. C.S. Lewis observed that almost all crimes of Christian history have come about when religion is confused with politics. Politics allures us to trade away grace for power a temptation the church has often been unable to resist. Yes, we see the dangers when they come from outside our faith, but do we stop them when we are engaging in those very same behaviors ourselves? Or is it instead, as African-American Columbia University professor John McWhorter insists, that the new far left political movement is itself a new religion. McWhorter thinks that woke racism is being used as a weapon in the pursuit of power. When we don't agree with someone, if they aren't liberal enough for us, we call them a heretic and excommunicate them from daily life. Think about Senator Al Franken, forced to resign over a poor sense of humor decades earlier, a resignation which many now regret demanding. Think Whoopi Goldberg, banished temporarily from The View for her misunderstanding of history. Think about the many leaders despised in the media for appear appearing in blackface before most people understood it as an offensive act. Think Abraham Lincoln, whose name is now being removed from schools and buildings because he wasn't anti-racist enough. In 2019, Reverend Todd Eckloff of the UU Church of Spokane, who lost his job in Kentucky for arguing against the statewide initiative banning gay marriage, wrote a small book of three essays questioning the UUA's new direction because, because he saw how people everywhere were being silenced. He printed hundreds of copies of this book to distribute at the 2019 General Assembly. 
Before anyone could read the essays, Eckloff was asked to immediately, immediately leave GA, and a majority of UU ministers were pressured to sign a letter denouncing his essays without reading them. Eckloff was also expelled from the UUA and the UU Ministers Association. Um, yeah, that is him. Um, and, uh, could you go to the next one, the fifth principle project? This decision was not without controversy. Reverend Alex Holt, who spoke to our fellowship in 2020 about addiction, asked that his signature be removed from the letter condemning Todd Eckloff. Other ministers set up the fifth principle project, which states, it has become apparent that our denominational governing body has lost touch with the spirit of its mission and drifted to a top-down, ideologically driven governing model. We seek to restore our fifth principle as the governing principle of our denomination. So next I'm gonna show you, here's a relevant comparison of the old left. I found this, I think in the New York Times, which I, well, I don't remember where for sure, but it sure seems relevant to me. Um, the old left in which free thinking and free speech were valued versus the new modern left in which people are told to basically mask up and shut up. And you can tell from the lovely bumper stickers there. It's hard to form a beloved covenantal community when we use racism as a weapon to wield power over one another, even within the same fellowship. Personally, I have twice been accused of white supremacist thinking in, effort, in an effort to change my mind about a budgetary issue. Recently, I read an article from a very mainstream, socially liberal newspaper, The Economist. The article featured interviews with people who have transitioned to a different gender and are now detransitioning. There is a resentment from some believing that modern medicine was too eager to carry out their wishes at a young age, and now they are regretting that choice but cannot fully reclaim their former gender or their fertility. I wanted very much to ask other buffers what they thought of this article but was afraid of being accused of being transphobic. When really I was just trying to get more information. And therein lies the problem. When we refuse to allow open inquiry, we squash what could be a very productive and informative discussion. We are no longer able to engage in, free, in a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We see things as black and white and no longer allow for a gray area. Decisions about how to think have already been made for us kind of like the religious traditions many of us sought to leave behind. And yet we all know that the world isn't simple and many moral issues are not cut and dry. Our world is a complex place and we still don't have clear answers to many complex issues like homelessness, poverty, domestic violence, crime, even war as modern events go to show. Go to the next one, please. Father Daniel Patrick Maloney made the following observation. Many people have claimed that racism is a major problem in police forces. I don't think that we know that. Police officers deal with dangerous and bad people all the time, and that often hardens them. They do this so that the rest of us can live in peace, but sometimes at a cost to their souls. Those of us who have police officers in our families understand that this is a complex issue. Many of us like having police protection in our towns. But you wouldn't know this from the fierce backlash experienced by Father Maloney, he was forced to resign. But we use, we you use must not talk about these things. We must worry, or we are told, we must worry more about COVID spreading to inmates than protecting the vic victims of violent crime. We must not question the UUA's claim that police brutality is a symptom of white supremacy and anti-black racism, even though many police officers are non-white, and many of those shot by the police are white. And in 2019, around 150 police officers were shot in the line of duty. And some of them were set up. And, um, and, and I know we've all read recent stories about that. We must, according to the UUA, agree with those we have labeled as prophets, such as Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, who writes, a positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. This approach is inherently political and it is backfiring tremendously. Recently, three members of the San Francisco School Board were recalled because instead of getting kids back to school during the two-year pandemic, the board focused on renaming schools originally named after supposedly racist historical figures like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. The next it will show you. 
New York Times, this is, this is coming from their article. The New York Times compared the situation to rows of unhoused folks living in tents. Instead of implementing housing solutions, the government brags about renaming the street where the tents are lined up. These are false solutions to real problems. New York elected a tough on crime former police officer because crime is increasing in New York and across the country. The overly broad attack on police is actually resulting in more deaths and most likely turning people away from the movement. This is to be expected when our faith chooses to be radical over being rational. Objectivity is being labeled as a white supremacist trait. All that matters, according to this theory, is subjectively how you feel. If you feel oppressed or insulted, then you are right, regardless of the other person's intentional intention. But rationally, we know this isn't true. We all know people with a victim mentality who misconstrue the intentions of everyone around them. I have been guilty of this thinking myself, but I'd like to think I can snap out of it with the right feedback. When we see the world as a battle between oppressors and the oppressed, when we see everything in terms of race, gender, and other forms of identity, we wind up with convoluted, nonsensical posts like this one. I'll read this one out. We can't address the enormity of climate change, an emergency that requires restructuring our society's lifestyles and power structures without addressing the root cause of colon the root cause, colonization. And to decolonize the mind is to deconstruct the binaries colonization has imposed on us all, the gender binary can't live on in the pursuit of climate justice. It has destroyed enough lives. So that might make sense to a few you use have been following all along. Probably doesn't make sense to most anyone else. Um, it feels like we're trying to distill big complicated issues down to just a few themes, oppression, colonialization, white supremacy, the same things we hear over and over again, decentering whiteness. Does racism still exist? The big question, yes, and it occurs across all people and all races. Should we work to end it? Of course. I admire the fact that you youth have often been at the forefront of ending discrimination against minorities, women, LGBTQ individuals, the disabled, the elderly, the poor. I am proud of UU efforts during the civil rights movement. I think we need to continue to teach inclusion in both our RE classes and our adult faith development workshops. This work is important. It should and will continue as an outgrowth of our first principle, recognizing the inherent worth and dignity of all individuals. If we actually live out our seven principles, we don't need the eighth, a resolution on racism. Thank you. Yeah, you can read that if you want, but I'm not gonna read that slide.